Hey everybody, this is Doug Moran and welcome to the Community Technical WebEx. We usually do these presentations on the first and third Wednesdays of each month. We're back from the summer break and hope to resume our normal schedule. Today, James Dixon, Pentaho co-founder and CTO, will cover some of the new visualization capabilities, APIs, widgets, and services available in the Pentaho BI Suite 4.0 Community Edition. There will also be uh, slides and a live demo. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, type them into the chat window to all participants and we'll answer them during the session. I'll also be monitoring the IRC channel, Pound Pound Pentaho on Freenode. After the presentation, we'll have time for questions and feedback. And now I'll turn it over to James. Um, so in uh, in Foro, there's a new plugin called Common UI. It's in both CE and EE. And uh, the path with the the path system path is uh, is right there. It's it's common UI all located within the system folder, and it contains the new uh, the new theming stuff, the new central themes. It includes a new client side uh, data API, some UI widgets, and some uh, some other services that I'm going to go through. I'm sorry if there's any background noise here. I got to uh, uh, home in their laying tile in the uh, laying tile downstairs. So um, one thing I'm going to use here is, is a test page. Is a set of test pages within the UI path for the uh, pages there. I'm going to switch to my browser. Um, show you a page. That has a, a list of test pages on there. And what I've done for this demo is I've added it. Let me log to the main style. I have a link to the in my menu so that I can get to uh, I can get to this test page throughout this demo. So I'll be in this at various points. This uh, demo page is in the uh, the main distribution, so everyone should have it. And that test page, it has uh, various different samples in there, some for the data API that we're going to talk about, some uh, HTML markups, some UI widgets that we put into um, in CE, and um, user console integration sample. It doesn't, at this point, it doesn't have samples of all of the services. Uh, I'll get to the other services later. So first, let's talk about the data API. This is a new API that's in 4.0, and it's sort of a driver-style architecture. The intent is to provide common data source discovery, data models, and query API so that you can write client code which is agnostic of the data source that's on the server to uh, avoid it being a lowest common denominator uh, approach. It allows pass-through. So you know what the data source type is and you understand uh, the nuances of what it can do and how to ask for those things, then you can can provide a an MDX statement, uh, or you can do things that uh, that aren't available through the through the main API, and therefore all of these comes back in a common format. And uh, in the, we're using the the CDA um, the table format. So the end here is that I can write one piece of client code to discover that I have ten data sources that are that are available. Some may be um, Adrian ones, some of them may be metadata model layers, some may be um, data source types like CDA. I can get a list of what those data sources are and select one and ask for additional information about it. And with the data source type I choose, I'm going to get the uh, same kind of information back about that data source. So the data model is going to have the same format for each of those uh, data source types. I can create a query uh, using a single API. I can select the elements that I want to come back from that data source, and I can execute that query and get data back. And again, the data that I get back is in a common format. So the intent, like, I can write one run of code that will connect to our available data source types. Finally, be able to present the user with information about that data source, let the user create a query, and get the and get the data back. Uh, so 
this is a this is a layer that is um, above any one specific data source. So it, it doesn't favor uh, the metadata layer or Mondrian or PDA or any other data source. It is intended to sit above those and try and provide a common layer, or common API for um, for all of those. So in point O, we have a an implementation for the Pentaho metric layer, is uh, which is reasonably complete. We have the uh, the start of an MDX one. So I've been using Roland's XMA servlet for the or XMLA library for the discovery and for information about the models. Uh, MDX generation is is a bogus in in some areas. So it uh, it very quickly will generate completely invalid MDX. I love anyone that would like to to contribute a good uh, MDX generation layer in there. I also started a CDA station so that we get information about the CDA data sources that are available, um, and that one's not complete. And I think I started on a PDI once where we could list PDI transformations, um, but again, that one uh, that one is not complete. So it's uh, complete in in part. It's definitely not. It's definitely a work in progress. Uh, and uh, if anyone wants to uh, to jump in and help out, and some of these areas that uh, that would be awesome. So uh, future one, obviously, OLAP for J is um, is an interesting one. We could maybe if a if we could create a lightweight serializable version of some of the uh, the OLAP for J code. So that we can have an inside query model that easier to generate than MDX. So we don't go through the MDX generation and the MDX parsing step. We can basically uh, serialize a, uh, an OLAP for J object over the wire and uh, and use that to create and submit queries. Um, that I think is a really interesting one. And then there's other things out like, like there at the the, um, the O data spec. And specific sources that we could connect up to, like Salesforce and Amazon, so you can do a, a client-side mashup. Um, it could be the uh, the Google geocoding service. Uh, we wrap that up in this uh, in this API. Uh, but there's a couple ones out there. So the intent is that if you are working with a customer and they have some server-side resource that you want access to, you create your own implementation. Uh, of the API, so that you can do a client-side mashup of, of that data source and whatever existing data sources we have that uh, that are implemented. So, so our first demo is going to be uh, a few days throughout this. First one I'm going to do, I'll do it standalone. Um, this test phase, the top one is the models test. So it is a uh, it's not very pretty, but the it's a single HTML file that has all of the script with comments in there showing you how to uh, how to do things. So the first thing is you can look in the code for this button to find out how do I get a list of data sources. You can see it's come back with three. I've got three metadata models and one uh, one Mondrian model. To come back with is just em envelope information. And so I have an ID. I have have a type, uh, name, and a description, and I can flip between them. So in, in one call, I got this information back, and then I can ask for additional information about a data source. So I'm going to load the data source for the orders model, and what you see is we have capabilities. The data source type is providing capabilities of what it can do. It's saying that it can sort, um, it can filter, it has customizable um, access. This, um, and filters are customizable. So the intent here is that a data source is able to describe the kinds of things that it can do. For instance, if running a um, running against a metadata model, I can filter on any of the fields that are, are available. Where if I was executing a, a PDI transform that, has, that takes two parameters. I can't filter. I can't get that transformation to filter on any of the the data sets that I'm the, the data calls that I'm going to get back. 
uh, there is some filtering available. I've got these two parameters that I can play with. Um, in that case, I'm going to get the same columns back every time. Um, I don't remove columns from that transformation. I can ignore them. We can maybe make it so that the server doesn't return them if you're not interested in them. But it's a, every time I run the transformation, it's going to all 20 columns of, of data every time. So that uh, that access is not customizable. On the data source capabilities, we get to the information about the individual column. So these describe the, the data elements that are available with the data model. So everything has an ID. I've got a localizable name and description. And then I've got these, these field types. So we have a, a number of different field types. A, uh, a data source can create its own field types if it wants. The one Something that's really important is this query element. So, for instance, a category, any category is just a collection of fields. So, you can't query a category itself. In the case of Mondrian, I can say that I want to see a specific level in uh, on an axis. But it, it makes less sense to say I want a um, I want to see an entire dimensional or an entire hierarchy. So. In Mondrian, measures and levels are queryable. In the metadata models, we've got attributes, um, dimensions. I think we've got facts somewhere. Um, yeah, here we've got some facts that are um, that are queryable. Got the uh, the data type, obviously. So we've got um, strings, dates, booleans, etc. And then if you can provide them, we've got basic things like um, alignment and font, um, aggregation type, default aggregation type, and available type. So if we go to something next, you can we've got something like order number, where I can do uh, count, count distinct, and none, whereas with um, quantity ordered, I've got some average, min, max, um, et cetera. And here you can see some of the format information coming in. So this is being provided by the data source on the server so that the client is able to have uh, some information about the fields that are available. There are other attributes that might be available. I want to extend this so that when you query for the information about the model, you can specify additional metadata attributes that you might be interested in. So for instance, if you want to know um, Wallace, something should be displayed on, uh, for instance, in, in charting. You can ask for that information, and if a certain element like um, country has that information, then it will give that attribute to let you know that that attribute is uh, is available. So that's a uh, metadata model data source. I'm going to go to the one now. You can see now we have two axes available in my capabilities. And the uh, my are my uh, my MBX IDs of my elements, ugly names. I've got my field types on now: dimensions, hierarchies, levels, um, and we've got our um, our measure. So you can see that uh, quantity and sales are are critical, as are my um, as are my levels. We don't have much information about font and alignment, but what we do have is this additional field which says child of. Um, I think that was in the other. So you can use this uh, child relationship to construct hierarchies on the clients. So we have a tree control where you say, okay, I want you to, in this tree control, go through the model, find everything that is a child of markets, Display that in a um, in a tree control for me. So, Android obviously the hierarchies go um, a little deeper. I think in the metadata models, I think we have child of scrolled off the page here. Yeah. So in, in the metadata models, um, everything is is a child of a um, of a category of some kind. So it's a very flat, just tool hierarchy for the metadata models. But if it also doesn't have, you know, PDI transform, um, if you have that, it will really just generate um, 
one could be called uh, fields and make everything make everything a child of that. So the, the source code for this is in um, the distribution under the common UI plugin under resources web model sample the facade I've I've put everything in here so that you don't have to go and, and look in multiple files. See all the imports. You can see how to create a specific data source handler. So here's OLAP um the is the mega models, here's OLAP, um the C D A handler. Um this isn't complete so when I when I initialize I'm not passing in the um the C one one and enable that just by putting this um, let's try it. Let's see what happens. I'm you it probably won't work all the way. Um, you have to initialize the, uh, the system. And individual functions would say how to how to load the list of data source models, how to display the model information um, from a specific model, how to load a um, load a model and get the information back. Um, and that's really all the JavaScript. So it's showing you basically things: how to get a list of models, how to uh, handle the fields that come back from there, and how to load um, the data source models. So let's see what happens when I try now with the CDA one. I may just get an error. Like I said, I wasn't expecting it to work real well. Expecting at least an error message. Obviously, needs work, as I said. The model sample. This model is the query one. So this goes deeper, assuming that you can, um, you know how to get hold of the list of models now. And it's populating these controls with the element that is found from the model. So here are a sorted list of, of the. Uh, the elements are available in that in this metadata model. So I'm going to pick, um, let's say, country. And if I say all, it's executed a query. It's got the list of the um, countries back. Or I can um, I can be select something and then maybe pick one or two measures. Um, so this obviously is enough data to populate a a, um, a pie chart. And this year, let me select two fields, and maybe I want to do a, um, a battle or something with some series. Um, it does client side sorting. So that you sort the uh, the data that came back. Uh, and I can add a filter. So let's say I'm going to do, I'm going to change this, select all countries, and then I'm going to add a filter. I'm going to add a filter on territory, and let's say. Um, So this this is a common dialogue that is using the data source to uh, to provide this uh, this dialogue end user. Now you can see my country list is being filtered in, and I've just got Australia, Hong Kong, Japan, New Zealand, um, etc. If I look at the query, so what we're using here, this is a JSON version of the uh, the MQL XML format that some of you may be familiar with. The um, adjacent representation of that uh, of that format. If I do the monitoring model, just really clean the field out. Going to monitoring model, you can see the UI is still able to populate itself. Um, really a um, hierarchical display, but I can still select a country. Um, you can observe it's now been. So the key, we've got the these uh, names for um, for these things. I can still do my multiple select <coughs> quantity and measures. You have the option to do an across axis, so the UI has adapted to the fact that we can use the the second axis. This was disabled when we were working against the 
um, the other role, the relational um, the model. I just could say uh, uh, territory, let's say product line. And you see now adding these to the um, to the other axis. The thing here is that this is one um, set of white code. There's no code in here which is aware that we're talking with a metadata model or a laundry model. The code is um, is classic and completely generic for both of these data sources. I'm going to look at um, that code, so that query sample. And everything is, is self-contained in this um, in this one file. Um, this is is a little bigger, um, but we've got a, essentially the same run of code for discovering what the are and loading a specific model. We've got some um, code that's going to. Well, we've got a specific model. We're going to look at the capabilities. Of, um, of specific things to work out how to deal with them in the eye. Um, and then there's a point somewhere um, where we're going to create a query. Uh, where is it? Okay. Um, this run of code in selections changed is the part code that creates a query and and submit it. In this case, it just took the current model and says create query. And then the thing saying, okay, I'm going to get a column object by saying model get column byte ID, and I'm, I'm pulling the value. Uh, that ID is, is coming out of a um, out of a combo box. And add that as a selection. We add the measures. Uh, we add the um, add the measures. So here I can say to the query, I say add a condition by ID. I pass in the ID of the column, I pass in the operator, uh, and the value, and that will create a, um, a query object for this specific query model. I'm going to submit that. We prepare that query and submit it, and then we just uh, the data that comes back, and you'll be able to see with um, in data display. We've got our CDA data table back. And we're just relating this object. So again, there's, there's no code in here that knows whether something is binal um, or OLAP or any other kind of data source because the data coming back in, in a common format. So going to here and looking at the query, you can see that here we've got um, we're generating an MDX statement. It's running off the end of the page for some reason. So the the implementation of the uh, of the query object is handling the data source specific pieces. So the, the MDX implementation is generating an MDX statement. The, relation, the relational metadata one is generating a realized um, uh, uh, metadata query uh, emitting to the server. Um, some other pieces. I'm going to come back to some uh, some additional things that are integrated in here later in the uh, in the presentation. Okay. So um, yeah. I had, uh, one question um, that was so with the day API, you can, for example, um, do monitoring cache priming in a programmatic way. Is that is that true? Uh, yes, you could you could do that. The, it's, you're going to do it from the it's going to be being from the client, um, and so the, the query results would be streamed back to the browser. Um, so you, you might want to do it that way, but you probably could because the data, everything that you're loading into cache is is going to be attempted to be streamed back to the browser. Okay, and uh, yeah, I think he was using that as, or hoping to replace uh, some X actions for uh, cache priming. Um, oh, you know what? Excellent idea. Yeah. 
if I've got actions that are returning, um, uh, you know, would all sets to uh, to something, or um, even um, you could do do some things um, for uh, for handling X actions. Um, JPI, I hadn't thought about that. That's uh, uh, kind of interesting. Okay, right, so on to on to the theming. So in 4.0, we have um, set style sheets, and the, the majority of the styles are all in um, in UI. But if a plugin needs to extend the central style sheet, it can. And the mechanism for clearing uh, the themes. And themes can be hidden users because um, users have the option to to switch themes. And, um, some of you, I'm assuming most of you, have seen the um, main theme, which is called Onyx. It's a uh, distinct departure from our original theme. Um, but I will. It is not called on at all, is it? Okay, so this is our out of box theme. It's called um, it's called Onyx. Under the view, you can um, change the theme to something else that you want. The other thing you can do is on the URL. Um, I think for pretty much most URLs, you can um, a different theme on the URL just to see that one page in a um, in a new theme. And you can um, so we go and look at the how themes are declared in the UI plugin. At third level, there's a themes XML. Um, you can see we've declared Onyx. We've got Onyx slate. Uh, there's a, a sample and a replaceable theme. So I'm going to be talking about um, this replaceable theme um, in a little bit. So you declare a theme in here, and it defines URLs that are um, job files and CSS files that loaded for that theme. The um, and if I can do uh, JavaScript files is is useful because you can do things like um, use the jQuery um, scroll bars if you want to in um, in a certain theme. Um, so you see here we're loading um, jQuery.js with uh, with some of these themes. Um, this theme, replaceable theme, it's a, a sample theme that is intended to help you um, quickly create a, a theme. It's hidden by default. I've I've modified the, the configuration to uh, to put that onto the theme menu. And the theme uses no, colors, so it's using the the CS standard named colors. There's like 140 or something um, named colors in um, in CSS. So sources will find themes. Um, here's Onyx, um, Slate, other um, et etc. So look at this replay theme. Let me switch them over. Switch to this replaceable theme, and there's a, a section at the top that describes the colors that are being used. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, with so things like the text color, so we have a black text color, which is the um, which is needed for text on a light background, and then text that shows up on buttons. Where light is the text, and that's ghost white. So uh, what I'm going to do is to go back to my sample page to pull up the the style sample. So this is the style sample using the um, the main Onyx theme. I'm going to switch just this page to show me the replaceable theme. Yeah, you can see it's mainly a a blue theme. It's not a pretty theme. It's not designed to look nice, 
um, I owned originally. So I've got this button text. Um, I've got this light text color on these different fields. For the style sheet, I can see text on buttons is, is ghost white. So I'm going to do a global place of ghost white. Um, place it with something hideous like that uh, on green. Now I'm going to refresh this page. of the uh, the text color on the dark background has been replaced with with, um, with green. I'm going to undo that because it's uh, it's quite ugly. Uh, you can see it did, there were seven occurrences of that specific color. Um, and so this has taken um, there's about uh, 20 to 30 colors in here, but use will allow you to um, to physically adapt a theme to a specific um, a specific look. Playing last night, I just went out and found a, uh, a website of there's this 99 bottles of beer on the wall um, pub somewhere, and this is their website. So I'm in GIMP, so the first thing I want to do is they've got this, this gradient here. I want to use that on the, uh, the buttons on the dialogue headers, etc. So I'm going to go and take my um, Color picker. I'm going to say middle color. I'm going to back to my replaceable theme. See here um, the the, the a, um, a gradient on, on them. That's in these um, these blue colors. So I'm going to add mid color and use the edges. So I'm going to I'm going to re be replacing uh, medium blue. With color, and I'm also going to indigo. I'm going to reduce some of the colors here. Uh, the top and bottom edge of the button are going to be the mid color from that uh, from that website. So if I read for now, you can see from the bottoms of the buttons have gone have gone red. So now my light color. I'm going to pick the light edge of this red color. Go to my replaceable theme. The light edge is the uh, is the second one. It's on flower blue. And with all those, and then I'm going to take um, dark color. And that's going to be me. Um, so these star buttons have a um, sort of horizon in them. They go from a a mid color. Right. Um, they go from a level color to a light color down the horizon, then they go to a dark color that lightens up towards the bottom. That's that Apple style um, gradient that we're uh, that one's copying. So uh, finishing that, you see those 47 replacements of that uh, of that color. So this means we have to uh, to stop, go through, um, and looking at each thing and working out what the colors are and what their intent is. But just that I have, uh, I've used the same color in two places here. So in this moment, we've now lost the distinction between that top gradient and that bottom gradient. But then if you want to, you can go back to the replaceable theme. So what I do is just keep a mapping of which color themes I've replaced with, uh, with which colors. So now you can see we've got this gradient in here um, on our buttons and our uh, and our headers, etc. Uh, as you can see, we've got um, dialogue titles, panels. So let's change the background color and the panel color. They've got this kind of cream background. Little 
premium. Take this cut and I'm going to replace the um, both the brown color. That's less blue. I'm going to replace that. I'm also going to do the, um, the glass pane in that uh, in that color as well. When I go back, we should have lost the um, the blue. Saving is not working reliably. They've all gone to that, uh, that background. If I show the glass pane, the glass pane is now um, that's, uh, that color as well. Um, so, uh, yes, I spent um, about uh, half an hour or so going through. Um, the only thing I did besides replacing colors was I actually put a, a edge in the background instead of um, instead of a color through um, the different pairs, uh, pulling colors from that uh, that website snapshot and created this theme where I've got the um, I'm using green that they had so they've got the green menu. Down so I'm using this green again with a gradient. I'm using it for um, toggle buttons and the toolbar background because that's, that's kind of what almost this is here. I'm using that for the menu rollovers. So here we got the toggle buttons. So I'm using this color. Um, and then on the rollovers, we're using the uh, the green color and also oops, I'm the uh, the selected color. So um, this style page, uh, one advantage of the style page is that it is purely um, HTML markup. So we're using um, Dojo or YUI or GWT or anything like that for for this page. So you look, if you want to, to generate something that's like one of these dialogues using um, YUI or um, in any other toolkit, you go and look at the um, the markup here, and um, so for instance, here's, here's the markup for dialogue. So whatever tool you're using um, on either side, whichever framework, if you generate this markup or something close to it, it will get something that looks like a um, a dialogue. So let's get in for most of these that, that show you the start and the end of that specific markup. So again, all, all designed to help you um, help create themes and create things that that fit in with the um, the system. So I go and um, uh, so one thing to to note is that if I change the theme of the home page, so I'm going to switch to the replaceable theme on the home page. I've changed this one page. I haven't changed anything that it um, that it loads. Uh, in iframes. So, for instance, if I go and open a new interactive report, you'll notice that what comes up um, inside here is using the Onyx theme. And that's because the interactive report page I'm using doesn't have that theme equals replaceable parameter on, on there. If I open that in its, um, in its app, it could go through and test. Um, any specific things, so and now we're loading up interactive reporting using using my new theme. I want to get the user console. If I want everything to look as if it is a new theme, I need to go and select it. Now that's being set for my section, and I open up an interactive report. I should see the theme being applied um, down within tab set as well. Um, a couple of places where the theming isn't working exactly. I should have a green background here. I've got the rollover correct on here, um, but the text should probably be uh, probably be the um, the red color. Uh, but you need to get a, um, a theme started. It's a very quick way to uh, to customize the look of the user console um, to your requirements. You notice the logo is gone, so the logo is part of the central theme. I do have an example. Theme 
of, um, of changing the logo. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, <coughs> I just covered that um, that style sample, and I can demo that. Okay. So 